Welcome back to our study in the book of Romans. This is Sonship Establishment, and this is going to pertain to the notes labeled 63 and 64. You have a note taker there in front of you, and I don't want to take a lot of time with this because we don't have a long time to spend with it. So, number one, describe the kind of relationship that we have with God. Father, Son, Father, Daughter, right, and that's what ought to go in that blank. Number two, without sonship prayer, we will not find what? Knowledge of God. And what is the knowledge of God referring to? Sonship education. Number three, what is the Father's role in sonship prayer? Thank you. The searching of the heart. That's, exact, that's His role in prayer. Number four, why does God want to search our hearts? Yeah, to make sure that we're getting this right, to confirm that we're headed down the right path. Number five, we have some infirmities that affect our prayer life how? Don't, we don't know what to pray for. That's right. Number six, what has God provided in order to fix that problem? And what does He do? All right, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us according to the will of God. Number seven, in order for God to deal with you in a real father-son relationship, He has chosen to set aside what? Omnipotence and omniscience. Exactly right. Okay. Now, that, if, if, did anybody, does anybody have any question about those seven issues right there? Because those are the main issues you need to have in your thinking. Yes, there's lots of other details, but that's the seven core issues. Any problems? Any questions? Okay. So here we go. As I told you at the end of the last lesson, what you're doing now, remember Romans chapter 8, verses 14 and 15 was sonship orientation. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 to 39 is your sonship establishment. And actually, Romans 9 through 11 is a continuation of your sonship establishment. Because as soon as you get established in your sonship, he takes you through Romans 9, 10, and 11 to explain the doctrine to the body of Christ about the interruption of Israel's program, that those natural branches were broken off, that we Gentiles got grafted in, don't get lifted up, because at the end of this, God's going to put those natural branches back into play. He's not through with His program with Israel and then he's going to complete that program with Israel. That's what those three chapters orient you to. If you didn't have that, the only thing you'd have are the things that are mentioned back in the book of Acts. But remember, the book of Acts is written to the Jews as the historical record of the fall uh, of Israel and the diminishing of that program. So then, when you get into chapter 12, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 is one of the biggest checkpoints you'll ever encounter in your sonship life. And you know what those verses say. We all memorized Romans 12 and 1 and 2 a long time ago. You know, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove... What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? And by the way, I'll just point this out to you, and we'll cover it in detail when we get there. God's not going to tell you His will. You're going to prove His will. That's, that's putting the shoe on the complete other foot. So then in chapter 12, beginning in verse 3, and running through chapter 15 and verse 7, you begin the formal education, and in this case, the learning of those four decision-making skills of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, and you'll learn them in that order. And then at the end of 15.7, when you've learned those four skills, if that's really all making sense to you, you're going to look at that and you're going to say, I sure hope he's not through because there's something else I'm expecting to hear. And that's what you get from 15.8 through the end of chapter 16. And there's something that's said to you there at the end of that book. Now, that being said, and by the way, I, I, I know Tommy has talked about this in his study on the book of Acts. And I, I don't, not everybody gets that, but let me tell you, in every one of Paul's epistles, when you get to the end of Romans chapter 16, there is something written at the end of that book that transitions you 
into the very next book. The subject matter right here at the end makes a perfect transition into what 1 Corinthians then introduces you to. At the end of 1 Corinthians, there's another transition that takes place that takes you right into the book of 2 Corinthians so that these form a flow of uninterrupted information and that takes you into Galatians and then Ephesians and Philippians and in every one of Paul's epistles, you have some transition verses that take where you are in that book and get you ready for what's about to be given you in the next book. That's, that's an amazing thing, and it makes the, all of those epistles flow into a single unit. Now, there was a famous Greek grammarian named A.T. Robertson. When I was in school, they lifted him up like he was some kind of a deity because A.T. Robertson was supposedly the greatest English-speaking Greek grammarian the world had ever produced. And A.T. Robertson, in his classes, used to teach this. The biggest... Uh, uh, offense that was ever done to the Bible is to not arrange Paul's epistles in their chronological order. He said they should have been arranged in their chronological order. In other words, the first one written be the first one in there, and etc. If you had done that, you would have completely destroyed the sense and sequence of the sonship education, which gives tells me volumes about A.T. Robertson's understanding of what's going on in there. You can be a Greek grammarian par excellent and be absolutely worthless as a son in the heavenly places. And believe me, God's not going to him in eternity and saying, hey, can you conjugate this Greek verb for me? <laughs> you know, the creature doesn't care what the Greek is. Just get me out of the bondage of corruption, please. Anyway, that's a remarkable feature that's in your Bible, and later we'll have a chance to actually look at those transition verses and notice what those are. But anyway, I'm just saying that um, that's when your education starts in Romans 12, 3. Now, I want to talk to you about what this means to what we're talking about in sonship prayer, because here's the practical application. When you begin in Romans 12, 3, and you come down through that chapter, you are going to be, first of all, you're going to be schooled, and I'm calling it godly wisdom, because this is really teaching you to think. It's the first component of godliness, teaching you to think about things like your father does. Wisdom is actually broken into six parts, and you're going to be taught six different components of godly wisdom. And you're going to be taught them in a very specific order. In fact, all of these are broken into component parts. But here's how this prayer works. When you get to run, and, that's, and then you'll understand why I said, just keep this in mind, the fullness of sonship prayer and the searching of the heart and your realization of your infirmities that result in you not knowing what to ask for as you ought are going to come to their fullest when you get into the education itself. Okay? Because... I'm going to say it now in case I forget to say it later. Right now, you can talk to your father, but what you're talking about right now is what it means to be a son. <laughs> father, I'm really glad you adopted me. I'm really glad I'm going to get the privilege of laboring with you. I'm really excited about this. I can't wait till we deliver the creature from the bondage of corruption. Father, I'm just, you know, and you can talk about what it means to be a son, and you can be excited and all of that. And there's nothing, by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the real reason for sonship prayer. It's not the real reason for prayer. The real reason for prayer is the success of your education. And when that happens, you won't be talking to him about what it means to be a son. You'll be talking to him about what it means to live like a son. Now, I'm going to leave that up so we can come back to it and make sense out of it. So let's suppose you're in Romans 12, 3, and now you're starting to get this first piece of godly wisdom. When he, and, I, and I, I'm real tempted to go to Romans 12, 3 and show you something because there is a lot more packed into this chapter than what normally meets the eye. 
Because those first verses talk about a man not thinking of himself more highly than he ought to think. And you think, oh yeah, you don't want to be lifted up with pride. That, that, there is really a lot more going on here than just that. But what I'm after is to say this. When you start learning about this first component of godly wisdom, you're going to be taught it in a certain context. Then you're going to go and learn the second one. Then something will happen where you'll begin to look. In fact, I'm telling you about it now, so you'll be probably thinking about this conversation. You'll look at that first one and you'll go, you know, I see how that works the way that was taught to me, but I think I could actually take that and use it somewhere else too. In an area he didn't teach it to me in. That's when that moves from just being information to being a principle that you can apply in more than one situation. That's why your Bible is not going to teach you about all the things you're going to do in the heavenly places with a list. He's teaching you how to think. So he'll do that by principle. And as he teaches you this principle, you're going to go, hey, I can use this principle. I think I can use this principle over here. And as you think about that, you'll be going, well, at least I think I can. So you know what you're going to do? You're going to go to your father and say, here's what I'm thinking. Is this, am I thinking about this right? Or am I off base here somewhere? And what you want is you, now, I, I'm not going to clear this up today. We'll do it next time. Because I know the questions that are already in your head. The questions that are in your head are, how am I going to know what God is telling me? Brother Mike, surely you're not talking about a voice from heaven. No, I'm not. How in the world am I going to know if God is giving me a yes or a no? How, what is it going to feel like when he searches my heart? How do I know when he's done? Those are the questions you really want answered, isn't it? And I'm going to talk to you about this issue, but you need to understand, and because it's not about you guessing what you think he might be saying. You know how dangerous that is? People can come up, look, I, when I was in Baton Rouge, I was at a church, and there was another church in town, and they had lost their pastor, and they thought instead of calling another pastor, they came to us and said, we think we would like to merge and become an outbranch of your church. And so as the co-pastor, I was over there on Sundays preaching while the pastor was preaching at the home church, you know, before we did this. And so we were kind of feeling the situation out. Well, as I was over there preaching... I discovered that what had blown this church up and caused their pastor to leave is a doctrine that he said God showed him. It was called the doctrine of spiritual wives. And here's how it worked. God has a perfect partner picked out for you. But if for some reason you married the wrong person, now you are married to them, that's your husband or wife, but in God's eyes, this other person has already been married to you because he was they were his pick. So you could actually interact with them like a real husband or wife. The problem for this pastor was what he thought was his spiritual wife happened to be the earthly wife of another guy that gave him a hiding pretty good. <laughs> and he decided God was calling him to a different field. You know, and funny how the Lord works, isn't it? <laughs> Mysterious ways. Well... That doctor, you, do, you know, here, you know what, here's what I found out. Just invent some screwball doctrine and they'll fill up the auditorium. Talk about sonship and you'll be lucky if 50 people come. Anyway, this, 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 this thing went on. Well, I tell you, after I discovered how entrenched that was, we decided to decline their offer of a merger. But you know what? It, isn't it real easy for anybody to stand up and say, hey, here's what God told me. I mean, with the, it's replete with that kind of stuff. This is not what we're talking about. This is not about me telling you what God is saying. That's not going to work either. 
This is really going to be between you and your heavenly Father in a very tangible way. But the point I'm trying to make with you here is you're going to go to your father and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing with this. And then you're going to ask him to search your heart to see if you're thinking about that the right way or not. And if you are, then as you put that into practice the next day, this is a little bit, now, oh, I hate to say it this way, but I just don't know a better way to illustrate it. There, pro there is, I'm sure. This is a little bit like, I, see, I'm telling you about it now, but the first times you do it, it's going to feel very unfamiliar. It'll be like the first, anybody here, who knows how to drive a standard shift? Okay, well, I used to, okay, all right. I, I, I grew up watching my dad shift that old Ford on the column. I grew up watching. And you know what? He'd be talking, and he wasn't paying attention to what he's doing. But I remember when it was up in second, he'd put his arm, just lay his wrist across that shift. And when he pushed in on that clutch, the weight of his arm just threw that thing down into third. And he never even thought about it. He wasn't even looking at it. He was just talking. And I remember thinking, wow, that looks awfully easy. And then we went out on a dirt road, and I got behind the wheel for the first time. I had the whole, it was like riding a jackrabbit. <laughs> and uh, whiplash. Man, you know what? He told me everything. I knew, you know, okay, here it is, push it on the clutch, start it up, put it in gear, let out on the clutch, give it a little gas. Here's how I gave it a little gas. Boom! 6,500 RPMs. That's it. Not so much gas. So they just barely touch it. And it's up to 850 RPMs. No, a little more. I thought, wow, this is hard. Let out on the clutch. Oh, easy. Yeah, the word easy. Very general term, right? How else are you going to do it? And, and you, know, you know what it took before one day I'm driving that and my own kids are going, well, that looks easy. It took experience, and that's what it's going to take with you. Because at the first, because you are inexperienced, you're going to ask your father, you're going to want to ask him about some things that you're not really sure what it is you're supposed to be asking for. This is where it's going to come in. And, it's and the reason I said it's not your fault, and we're all in that condition is because that's the condition every son is at. He's inexperienced. Even though I'm telling you about it, getting behind the wheel and putting it in gear is a different story. Are you with me? But that's where this really comes into play. That's why I said it's not about me and what I tell you here. It's about what you're going to do with your heavenly father out there. That's the practical application of the education. What I'm going to teach you in here is just what's written. What I can't teach you is in your life the ways that you're going to see where that same principle can be put into work. And sometimes you'll get it right and sometimes you won't. And it'll be just like an earthly father. You're going to come in at the end of the day and go, that went really not too good. Uh, what did I do wrong with this? Or maybe you'll be thinking, you know what? That actually went pretty good. And then you'll be thinking about what's happening, say, the next day. And you'll be saying to your father, here's what I think I'm going to do with this principle. Am I thinking about this right? Now, you won't ask him to search your heart every time you pray. But now, are you getting a little bit of an idea why in the middle of the day, you may utter a prayer that's just a couple of sentences long because you'll be thinking, Father, this is how I thought this was going to work, right? Like this, or this is what I'm about to do, or, you know, I'm th and if what you're going to have is a topic of the day. Whatever you're learning in your sonship education is going to be the thing you're going to be discussing with your father as you gain experience with that particular principle. Do you see? And as you learn more and more, is your education with that first one over yet? Well, no, you'll still discover more ways to apply that. 
And, and, and suppose you're through with the six components of wisdom and now you're in the first one of justice and you're going to be working on this and maybe you'll be working on this one and maybe you'll be working on this one. And then maybe something will come up. By the way, and when it talks about, you know, adding discretion to that, you know what it's talking about? It's taking one or more of those and combining them together to make a decision about something. And you may use two, three, or all four of them to make that decision. And you're going you're gonna to have to get experience. Well, just, I mean, it's, I'm not scaring you with it. I'm just saying, you will. The more you do it, it'll be like anything else you've ever done. It scared you to death at first, and then you found out, oh, you know what? I, the more I do this, the better I get. And, and, and you're going to be discussing it. That's, that's why your education is dependent upon sonship prayer. Because if you're not talking to your father about it, and you're not hearing him uh, assess, you know, what he's hearing out of you, you're just at a standstill, do you see? That's, I hope you're seeing that's how you know the education doesn't take place in here. You're going to take what you get in here, and it's what you do between you and your father that's really going to produce this education. You see? And it's going to be different. What Tom's going to be dealing with is different from what Boo's going to be different with, which is something different than, you know, what the rest of us are going to be. I mean, we're all going to be dealing with different. I mean, that's where it is. Even a husband and wife, it'll be different. And um, that inexperience is really what those infirmities are about. Now, there's two things that I want to put up here that you're going to be using to be able to ask for things. Two things that are mentioned, that Paul's going to mention them. He's going to refine this for you. He's going to take it out of just prayer, and he's going to put two things up here. The first one is request, and the next one is supplications. Of those two, which one do you think is the more intense, request or supplication? Supplication is the more intense of the two. When you're making a request, you know what I think of? I think it was somebody calls in the radio station and says, oh, play such and such. We got a request. You know, and that one, I mean, you are asking for something, but sometimes it's supplication. And what I'd like to do is take you into, into these scriptures to show you how even though these are part of prayer, Paul separates them out from just prayer in general. Take me to that, there you go, Philippians 4, 6. Be careful, let me just make sure I'm at the right place I'm supposed to be at. Okay, be careful for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And look what he says. In, no, no, back me up. In everything, by prayer and what? Supplication. Why, was, why would he say prayer and supplication? Because he's trying to separate supplications out. Now, give me this next verse, Trent. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching therein too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now you're going to find out when you get over there that you can actually make supplication for other saints. And God will answer that. I mean, by the I mean, does it kind of make sense? If the Spirit makes intercession according to the will of God, are you actually going to be able to make supplication for other saints? Yes, you will. And there's, a, there's an issue about that. And we're not over there yet, but I mean, I just wanted to show that to you that that's certainly sitting there and it's something that we're going to be looking at. But supplication is a form of prayer that's more than just prayer. Supplication has the idea attached to it that the person who is making supplication is in some kind of distress and the one they're making supplication to, is that, and do I have a definition in there? Trent, is the net? No, it's not. Okay. The one they're making supplication to has the ability to fix that. Now, not, Paul's not talking about physical distress. You know what the distress he's talking about? Yeah, he's talking about not knowing what you're supposed to ask for. That's a problem. And so, and, and by the way, there's some other problems too. Because of your inexperience, you won't always know exactly how to apply something. And so you're going to make some requests and you're going to make some supplications. 
Now, we'll have reason to look at this in more detail later on. I'm just kind of exposing it to you now and pointing out that oftentimes those things all get separated out. If he didn't, he would just say this, praying always with all prayer in the Spirit. But instead he says prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So there's something to be noted about that. Um, and Romans 8, 26 and 27 are supposed to give us some peace about those infirmities because th that, that's, that's the, the cure that the Father has given us for the problem those infirmities call, uh, cause for us. Um, let's see. There's a couple of things here. I'm looking at my time, and I need to make sure that we, there's a couple of things I can't not cover with you here. Um, I hope that from what I've said so far that you understand that in these verses, 26 and 27, God is not just completely changing the subject. What He's really doing is, because this is going to be an issue for your education, does everybody kind of get that? Because this is going to be an issue in your education, you're not going to know what to ask for, and you already know that if interactive learning isn't taking place, you're not going to find the knowledge of God, that what He's doing is He's setting the stage early on to say, I know about a problem you're going to have, and when you run into that problem, you won't freak out about it because you'll know I've already made a provision by the Spirit making intercession for you. But the thing I want to do now is make sure that you know, well, where did that really come from? Where did I first see that? And how do I know Mike just didn't invent that? How do I know that's something I can really go back and put my finger on? And that's the thing that I want to do for you now so that you do see that this thing is really sitting in there. So let me take you to Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 2. You know this is the table of contents. When he says, to know wisdom and instruction, that is your sonship orientation. That is to know it exists and to know it has value, right? And the second part, to perceive the words of understanding, that is your sonship establishment. This whole thing, remember, this whole thing is laid out in the table of contents here. To perceive is an advancement on to know, right? And what you're supposed to perceive is the particular way in which this, what we have been calling the curriculum or the sonship education, what it's going to do for you. You're actually perceiving now ways in which you're going to benefit from that. And so that's, that gets done in your establishment. That's a, that's a little bit of an advancement on just knowing. Now, so if I'm going to say, if Paul's over here in 8, 26 and 27, he's talking about some infirmities that are going to keep us from knowing what to pray for, where in the world could we go back and take a look at that? Well, you already know that prayer is part of interactive learning, right? You know there was those three commitments to the education. Honest attendance, you're here for the right reason, not to show off your new gadget, okay? Number two, you're, you're, you're not going to leave before you get your questions answered. That's the interactive learning that takes place in the group. But then there's an interactive learning that takes place between you and your Heavenly Father, and that's sonship prayer, right? And if you cry after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding, then you'll find the knowledge of God, right? And then the third one, of course, was the top priority. You can't just go, well, you know, I mean, if I make it, I make it, and if I don't, I don't. It's just kind of, you know, I mean, if you want to do that, you can, but you, it won't work for you. you. You already get that. Well, in this one, since, this, since Paul is doing, of the three commitments, this is the only one that has you saying something, right? Lift, your, lift up your voice for understanding. Cry after knowledge. That's you saying something. Well, when you get to sonship prayer, guess what? That's you saying something. Yes? Okay. So it kind of stands to reason, if you're going to find out about this issue, you should either have to go back to the table of contents that talks about your establishment or the interactive learning, or you're going to have to go to the exhortations, one of the two, because we didn't do one thing in Israel's doctrine, remember? But we did look at exhortations. So you're going to have to go, well, here it is in the table of contents to perceive the words of understanding. Anything there that alerts you to some infirmity you might have? I mean, do you really see anything outlined for you there? 
It's really, a table of contents is just telling you what it is. It's to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, uh, you know, to receive, to, to, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. That's what the next verse is going to say. Well, so if it's not really sitting there very clearly, let's take a look at the exhortations. Now, the exhortations for sonship establishment run from Proverbs chapter 1, verse 6, am I right? 5 is the table of contents, right? I'm not looking at it. Oh, you're right. 7. 1, 7 to chapter 2, verse 9. That's the exhortations for sonship orientation. Establishment starts in 2.10. And it, I can't remember now. I have it all memorized. But, the, here, but here, here's my point. Where, where in the exhortations did you hear about if thou criest after knowledge, if thou liftest up thy voice for understanding? What we called interactive learning. That's what we called it just to sum it up in a title. Where did you run into that? In the Proverbs. You've already covered it. In chapter 2, the first five verses. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, that was the three commitments to the education. And, and it's in verse 3 that it says, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge... If thou liftest up thy voice for understanding. Remember all those, those three ifs? If, if, and if, then thou shalt find the knowledge of God. So you've got to meet those three commitment levels. Well, in verse 3, this is the one that went with interactive learning. So here's what I was thinking. If I'm going to learn anything about what Paul was talking about over there, about lifting up your voice or asking God, it's going to be somewhere in the close context of that. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, I just went back to where it was in the exhortations and thinking, this has got to be the pretty close proximity. I know that you probably don't care about this, but what I'm trying to show you is this isn't just an invention. This is really how this is laid out, okay? So with that, with that, in fact, uh, I'm just thinking about what to say and what not to say. I narrowed it down more than that. All right, for some of you, this is your nap time. For others of you that care, I'll give you a little insight. In this thing of Proverbs 1, 7 to 2, 9, if, just turn over there in your Bible. This is not on the PowerPoint. Just turn there in your Bible and let me show you something. Part of those exhortations I could eliminate from going to, to try to find this. I, I could just, uh, I could eliminate them all together. Go to Proverbs chapter 1, and what you're going to see is in Proverbs chapter 1. Now, this is not in your notes. I'm just talking about this. If, if we were going to talk about everything that I understand about this, it would take us forever to get through here. Not because I know so much. There's just so much in here. But in Proverbs 1, there's somewhere in this chapter in the exhortations, that means starting in verse 7, because 2 to 6 is the table of contents, where a change takes place, and the exhortations become unique to Israel, not for us. Does anybody notice in chapter 1 where a distinct change takes place in the chapter? I can't, if you don't get it, it's okay. I know you haven't been studying this. But you, you, someone might be able to just notice where it jumps off. No, no, it's verse 20. Verse 20. Let's see, in ver, he's saying, my son, as he comes down through, look at verse, verse 8. My son, verse 10, my son, verse 15, my son. And when he gets to verse 20, suddenly it's not the father talking to the son. Look what he says. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief places of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? Now, wisdom is doing... Now, here's how I know this is different. Not just because suddenly it's wisdom talking, but this was actually fulfilled in history. 
When did wisdom utter her voice in the streets, in the gates, and in the concourse of the city? During the days of Jesus. That's what he was doing. And that puts you smack dab in Israel's program. So you know what that means? From verse 20, from, from chapter 1, verse 20, through the end of this whole discourse on wisdom, was it run to 33, I think? Yeah. From 20 to 33, that is out of consideration because that was all fulfilled during the earthly ministry of Jesus. So the only thing I had left to pick from was from chapter 1, verse 7 to verse 19, or chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. But guess what? It's in chapter 2, verse 3, that the interactive learning shows up. So, Trent, give me that next slide. So, you know where I found it? In Proverbs 2, 6 to 9. Let me show you what we're looking at here. And this is, by the way, real easy to read over this if you're not paying attention to the terminology. Now, look, this is where... This is where it's terrible to be doing four sessions in two because you have to read the notes. But let me, let me hit this for you so you'll know. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk up uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment. He preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. Now, what have I been telling you? I told you that the fullness of this interactive learning, the fullness of the searching of the heart, and when your infirmities are going to really come into play is when you're in the education proper in the future. Yes? What in the world, what's, what, what is he talking about in these verses 6 through 9? Did anybody pick anything out of there and go, oh my goodness, this is what he's talking about? The components of what? R Are you talking about these? Uh, yeah, yeah. The four sonship skills? Yeah. Skills. yeah. What's, what's the only thing that would throw you for a loop here? Look, the Lord giveth wisdom. And then he's going to talk about that. And then look at verse 9. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity. What's the only thing that throws you for a loop? Righteousness. righteousness because you would think what word goes there? Wisdom. No, not wisdom. Justice. And do you remember what God let you remember what justice is? Right and wrong based on a set of norms and standards. Righteousness, guess what? That's God's norms and standards that tell you what is right and what what is good and what is evil. So there's a reason, by the way, and I don't have time to get into it today. There's a reason he didn't repeat the word justice there but he used the word righteousness. When we get into godly wisdom in Romans 12, we'll come back to this issue, and I'll show you what he was doing. But do you see? Wisdom, righteousness, judgment, and equity. It's the four decision-making skills. He took you into the future, didn't he? Well, that's what I was telling you. These things don't come into play until you're over there learning these four decision-making skills. Now, here's the next issue that we should have picked up when we read through this. Because here's how people read this. Oh, man. Here's how people read this. They, in verse 8, He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of His saints. Here's the way they read it. God picks the path. But it didn't say He picks the path. It says He keeps the path. And what does He do to the way? He preserves it. He didn't pick any of it. Guess who, guess who chooses the path? The Son does. By the way, there's more than one path. He keepeth the paths, plural, of judgment. Is there a time when you're going to have to make a decision and there's no wrong answer? All, one may be better than another, but you know what? They're all a path of judgment. You can pick the one that you pick. 
He keepeth the paths. But notice when it comes to the way, I don't want to get into a debate about the ways of the Lord back in Israel's program. But what we're talking about here, but he preserveth the way singular of his saints. There's many paths, but they're all going one way. Are you with me? Okay. If you're the one that's going to pick the path, you should be thinking to yourself, wait a minute. I'm going to be picking the path? Is there, a, is there anything that gives you any consternation about that? At this point? Yes. What, is your, what, is, what is your problem? I don't know what. I don't know. What the, I don't know. And that's the whole point of Romans 8, 26 and 27. There's some things you don't yet know. But you won't always be in that condition. You will eventually know. And guess what? The Spirit won't make intercession for you anymore. Do you know why? You'll be asking Him yourself. By the way, that's why it's called an infirmity. You know what the word infirmity carries with it? That that's not, that you can be, it, well, it is improper function that can be fixed. Remember what they used to call a hospital? Infirmary. You're going to go in there and you're going to get fixed. But here's the thing. This is going to get fixed. Not, right, your experience is going to bring you to a place where you're going to know exactly. That's when Paul later is going to say, you're going to pray with understanding and knowledge. Hallelujah. But God says, hey, but when you're in that place where you don't know, don't worry about it because guess what? The Spirit knows exactly what you needed to ask for. And he is going to ask me in your place, and I'm going to do it just like you were the one that asked. <laughs> I just can't get over that. I just look at that, and I think, man, that is just marvelous. So when we go back, by the way, in Proverbs 2.8, when it says, no, give me that when you had up, Trent. That was good. He keepeth the paths of judgment. In a moment, we'll highlight the one preserveth the way of the saints. What do you think he's talking about when he says he keeps the paths? What do you mean he keeps them? What, what, what's really going on with that? Or preserveth the way of his saints? What, what's, ta- what's going on with that? What's in your mind? I'm sorry? Makes it possible? Mm. If, if, he, if he says he's going to, let's do preserve. If somebody preserves something, what does that mean? Okay. If they're keeping something, What'd Trent say? Uh, okay. All right, let me, look, uh, my time is really getting away, so let me just do this. Here's what, because he's talking about the paths of judgment, who's, make it, who's, who's choosing that path? You are. By the way, what is, is going to give you the knowledge to choose a right path? Uh, uh, okay, but I mean, it, it's the education, right, that, that teaches you to do that. Okay. When you choose a path, by the way, he, oh, you're right. What, remember, you're going to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You're going to choose a path, and your father says, now that you've chosen a path, I've got to do something to keep, keep you on that path and preserve your, preserve the, and preserve your way. Why? Well, it's, it, it is, but it's more than just encouragement. Why has he got to keep that path? But, oh, I'm almost gave you the answer. Uh, you know what? That's exactly right. You've got, in fact, I know it's not on the PowerPoint. Turn to Proverbs chapter 2 and look at this. This is la- probably the last thing we're going to get to do. Because you have two, two entities that are trying to get you off of the path you're on and onto a different path. It's one thing to choose the path. It's another thing to stay on that path. Now, by the way, I know what you're doing right now. You're shipping, you're, you're shipping the idea of God's omnipotence back into the program here. He keepeth the path and preserveth the way. It's not by His omnipotence. He doesn't do that by His omnipotence. Guess what He does it by? He does it by the education. He's going to tell you about it. Now, look, you're in chapter 2. 
We came down to um, um, verse 9. Look in verse 10. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is ple pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man. Anybody remember what the evil man was? The course of this world. So look what he said was, he was going to use to deliver him. What? Discretion and what? Understanding. See, he's not going to magically, by his power now, preserve your way. He's using the sonship education to preserve your way and keep your paths. Do you see how it's all... This, there's nothing missing out of this. And so, and, and look at the terminology that's used here. Come on down. To, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things. Uh, your notes, you'll have to look at froward in the notes. I don't have time to talk about it. Who leave the paths of, uh, of uprightness. There's the paths you could have taken to walk in the ways of darkness. Keep reading, and look how this terminology keeps going. It says, Who rejoice to do evil, and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked, and they froward in their paths. There's a lot of evil paths. There's a lot of evil ways. Your father has one way, and there's many paths that go that way. And as a son, you're at liberty to choose that path. And then in the education, he's going to use discretion and understanding to keep that path and preserve that way so that you're able to see, wait a minute, this is the evil man trying to get me off on a froward path. Froward means contrary to or away from. If it's to and if it's fro, do you see? And so... When, and, when he, and, 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 and we'll just keep reading. Verse 16. Uh, to deliver thee from the strange woman. What is that? The policy of evil. Now there's the second thing. Uh, Even the stranger with flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the God of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God for her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the death. You ought to go through this chapter and circle every time ways and paths gets mentioned. And you know what you're going to find? That the son is going to choose a path and the father is going to use the sonship curriculum to keep him on that path and preserve his way because there's two that are trying to get him off of that path onto a different path. Do you, do you see? I mean, to me, I just look at this and I go, Wow! I mean, I'm looking, you know, I'm at home studying. It looks really good. I get here and people are going like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have macaroni when I get home tonight. I'm just, you know, but, but it, I mean, you, you can read through this chapter and you can see that this thing just keeps going on and on. Look at verse 20. Then thou mayest walk in the way of a good man and keep the paths of the right. Do you see it? So what he's saying here is, you're going to make choices. You're going to choose a path. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Isn't that the way we were brought up, though? Oh, God, just tell me what you want me to do. Here's what he said, wants you to do. Get educated and make a good decision. And, 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 let's, and let's keep you on that path. Now, there's a lot more that I need to look at here, and I'm just looking through these notes. Oh, boy. But the thing that I need to make sure that you understand is that He's not the one choosing it. You're the one choosing it. And that there's, the, the, well, you, you, the things that we've talked about, it is the highlights of that, and you'll see it. I just really want you to read the notes because that's going to take you back to these verses and it's going to point these things out so that you really do see that there's a danger that once you get over here, especially when you're inexperienced, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to really talk to your father a lot to stay on with this. Because the paths that are going to be offered to you are going to be very appealing. And you know what you're going to find yourself saying? Exactly what I said earlier. There's only one thing in the world that will substantiate the decision that I'm now making, and that's this book. Because the course of this world is going to make sure people look at you like a kook. 
And the policy of evil is going to bring pressure to bear to make you rethink your decision. But believe me, nothing will be put on you that you will not be equipped to handle. Isn't that a great promise? All right, so there's the gist of where we are. Thank God we got through that. I'm worried about that. So here's what we're going to do. When we come back next time, we have some more things to nail down. Let me just ask you this, and this will finish it. Do you see now how that what Paul is talking about in Romans 8, 26 and 27, about not knowing what to ask for as we ought and all of that, really does take you into the future from your establishment to when you start the education itself and you're going to need to be talking to your father every day about the practical application of the things that are being outlined in these four decision-making skills. Do you see that? All right. You'll see it more, but if, if that light is on for you just a little bit right now, that's exactly where I need you to be. If it's on a lot, well, that's even better. But that's, that's, that's where we're headed with this. And I know we have lots of questions to answer, and we will get to them. If you only knew what was waiting. So exciting. Okay, let's have prayer and we'll be done. Father, thank you for these dear folks and their commitment to you and your word and the sonship education, this life that we're going to live as sons that's going to train us for what we're going to be doing in eternity. And this thing is going to be, at its very core, is going to be our communication with you as we're learning these things and putting them into practice in our life and learning to apply them in areas other than the way we were taught them. This is the skills that we're honing to be able to do the work that we're going to be doing in eternity. And thank you for the great privilege of this. And Lord, I pray that these things are doing exactly what we said in the beginning they were designed to do, and that is to produce an absolute confidence that what you tell us is true and an absolute confidence that this curriculum is geared for our success and nothing has been overlooked or left out. There are no surprises that we'll encounter. There are no exceptions to the rule. There's no caveats to be offered. But these things, these are all, Lord, taken into consideration. And if there's anything that would trip us up, Lord, you have, you have made a provision for that, just as you talk to us about sonship prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your manifold wisdom in all of this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.